computer. And we're ready to start. Thank you, Rabbi Kimchi. Thank you, Eli. Good morning, everybody. I see Henry's with us. Good morning, Henry. Nice to see you. And uh, everybody else here. I think George is with us and uh, several others of our regular Mishtatvim. Um, Nice to see everybody here this morning. I'm sure you're all uh, getting ready for the for the visit of the president of the United States of America. I'm sure it's an important important date in all your diaries. But this is a uh, an important. Uh, I'm sure I, he, he's just really dropping in here on his way to Saudi Arabia. You know, I don't. I mean, he's really he's really interested in visiting Saudi Arabia. As Pasnish not to drop in here, so he'll. He'll drop by here as well, but he's actually not particularly interested uh, in, in coming here or being here. But um, it's going to be enough to sort of disrupt all the traffic in Yerushalayim for a couple of days. I think that's the uh, that's the upshot of this visit. But Chazal uh, say, Leiv Malachim Yad Hashem. Tell me about it. We can't move from our home. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. You're locked in. You're locked in. Leave Malachim Biyan Hashem. The Kamsh should put the right thoughts and the right decisions into his mind. And uh, please God uh, to, be a, to be a friend of, of Am Yisrael and Klal Yisrael. That's his, uh, from our point of view, that's his tachlis in this world, if he would only understand that properly. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going further in our, um, in our learning. And uh, as I mentioned frequently, one must lose sight of the tremendous privilege it is to sit in Eretz Yisrael and learn Torah together. That is really something which so many generations of Klal Yisrael have dreamt of and thought of. And uh, if you read about some of the writings of the Talmide Hagra, uh, the Vilna Gaon's Talmidim, who made Aliyah in the early 1800s, right? The early 1800s, <laughs> the Talmide Hagra made enormous, enormous uh, sacrifices, uh, physical, financial, everything, in order to come to Eretz Yisrael. And, uh, uh, and uh, they came, they originally went to Tzfat, uh, and then there was this big earthquake in Tzfat in the 1830s, and they went afterwards to Yerushalayim. But uh, <clears throat> if you read what their motives were, <clears throat> so some of them were motivated by the idea that uh, the arrival of Mashiach was imminent, and um, and they wanted to be in Eretz Yisrael for the arrival of Mashiach. But many of them were not messianic. They came to Eretz Yisrael because they believed that doing mitzvahs and learning Torah in Eretz Yisrael was many times more significant spiritually uh, than learning Torah and doing mitzvahs in Chutzlat. And that the same mitzvah, the same piece of Torah that you learn in Eretz Yisrael, is, is magnified spiritually enormously, simply by being located here in Eretz Yisrael. And that's an idea one should never lose sight of, that the, the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael um, connects to the Kedusha of the Torah and the Kedusha of Mitzvahs. And in that sense, it's a, uh, a, a great privilege, even for a few minutes on a Tuesday morning, to sit together and learn some Torah and whatever one could do here. I must say the flip side of that is also a bit more um, sobering thought. And the same thing is true regarding Averis, as I'll say, that Averis done in Eretz Yisrael are, are, are worse than Averis done in Chutzlaretz. Uh, and therefore, in a sense, um, the terror speaks about Klal Yisrael doing Averis in Eretz Yisrael as triggering off um, all sorts of terrible things. So Bez Hashem, we will uh, do our best to keep the balance in the positive, in a positive frame, and our davening and our tefillah and our and our Torah here in Eretz Yisrael uh, should be um, connected uh, to the kedusha of Eretz Yisrael, and in that way, uh, our coming to Eretz Yisrael should indeed be an aliyah, not just in a geographical sense, but also in a in a ruchnius, in a ruchnius sense. We're looking at Sefer Bereishis. Last week we were still looking at the end of Parshas Lech uh, which was chapter 17 in Bereshis, uh, about the bris Mila. And we saw lots of interesting things about the bris Mila. 
um, the use of the name Shin Dalad Yud and what it meant, and what that, that name of Hashem means. And that the whole of the Brismila was actually a, a covenant. That the covenant of HaKadosh Baruch with Avraham Avinu expressed itself in the bris, in the, in, in the circumcision. I mentioned to you, I think in passing, I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly, um, a lot's happened between one Tuesday morning and the next Tuesday morning. I have Baruch Hashem many shiurim, so I don't remember exactly all the details. But it's interesting to note, next time you're at a bris milah, I'm sure many of you uh, have had, and please God will have, the experience of being present at bris milah, if you pay attention uh, to the brachas being made. Now here in Eretz Yisrael, they say Shech Yonu, in Chutzlach we don't say Shech Yonu. But putting that aside for a moment, um, the question is, uh, how many brachas are made at a bris mila? So you will, you will hear two brachas. One is a bracha, which is Hashem, and Yishan, and Tosav, and Zvon, al Hamila, right? And that bracha is made not by the father of the baby, but by the moil. The moil makes the bracha al Hamila, right? The father then makes the bracha, l'hachniso bivriso shel Avraham Avinu, right? And what's interesting is, if you look, we tend to call this whole event a Brit Milah. Those two words, we put them together to describe this event. But the truth is that the Brit and the Milah are actually two separate events, right? The Brit and the Milah are not the same thing at all. The Milah is the circumcision, it's the operation, right? And the Brit is the uh, um, eternal connection that we have with the Rabbeinu Shalala. And what's happening here is, we call it a Brit Milah, but, the, but in actual fact, if you listen to the two brachas, in one of the brachas appears the word Milah without the word Bris, and in the other bracha appears the word Bris without the word Milah. In other words, these are two brachas. One is made on the Milah, one is made on the Bris. The actual Moyo doing the circumcision itself, he's not taking the baby into the covenant with HaKadosh Baruch It's not his child. Right? He's just performing the circumcision. So he just says, But the father is doing something else completely. The father is taking his child <clears throat> and making a bracha to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he is now merited taking this child into the covenant. The covenant with HaKadosh Baruch Hu relates to the way the child will be brought up and educated and his future and his values in life and what he's... Uh, and what he's um, planning to do with his life, all that has got to do with uh, the Brit, right? The Mila is in fact an Os Bris Kodesh. The, the male uses these words, actually. Os Bris Kodesh means the Mila isn't the Bris, the Mila is a sign of the Bris, right? It's a bit like, you know, the flag of a country. The flag is not the country. The flag is the symbol of the country. The country is one thing and the flag is something else. But the flag and the country are intimately connected because when you fly, wave the flag, you're identifying with the country. And similarly, when you engage in the Mila, you're identifying with the bris, right? But the bris is the covenant, the special covenant that I come to says, Avraham Avinu, Voyisi Lecha Lelokim. Klali Shor and I Baruch will have a personal relationship. And what's interesting is to contrast this in a sense with the original, the first bris in the Chumash, which I think I mentioned a few weeks ago. What was the first bris? Anybody remember? What was the first covenant in the Chumash? With whom was the first covenant in the Chumash made? Noach, yes. The first covenant was made with Noach. Interestingly, HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not make a covenant with Odom and Chava. But he makes a covenant with Noach, and that covenant is actually not a personal covenant. It isn't a Vayisi Lecha Lelokim. The Lecha, the, pers the personalization of the covenant, doesn't happen with Noach at all. With Noach, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is making a covenant with mankind with the whole of the Enoshut. Mankind gets a covenant with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and that covenant isn't a personal relationship, but it is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if you like, guaranteeing, right, that 
the world will continue to exist. In other words, Noah, after the flood, was a bit nervous. Are we going to get these floods on a regular basis and wipe everything off the face of the earth? Kodesh Baruch says, no, I'll never do that again. In other words, the Kodesh Baruch in some way is guaranteeing planet Earth that, that mankind are able to work the planet and live on the planet with confidence, even though they might feel that the existence of planet Earth is fragile and the thing could explode or the thing could implode or floods could come or whoever, whatever could happen. Uh, you know, I, I suppose uh, meteors could hit the Earth or, or, or the sun could, could have a, something could block out the sun. All sorts of uh, terrible tragedies could uh, happen. Akash Baruch is guaranteeing Noach that he can confidently live on planet Earth and that these uh, um, cataclysms will not take place. That's the first bris. Nothing to do with a personal relationship with God. So in a sense, the first bris is with God the creator, right? But the second bris with Avram Avinu is not so much with God as the creator of the world. It's more with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, on the contrary, who is Sha'oma Dai Olama. We saw last week the Gemara Chagiga says that Shin Dalad Yud means HaKadosh Baruch Hu said Dai, which means, and that's what I touched on a little bit last week, I just want to uh, connect that with today's, today's Shia. What does it mean, Dai? HaKadosh Baruch Hu created an imperfect world. And the imperfections of the world are in fact an invitation to mankind to participate in the perfection of the world. That it's our, our job in some way to make the world a better place to live in on all sorts of levels, primarily a spiritual level, but also a physical level. That we, are, that we are charged with the job of perfecting God's world. And if we do so, we are in that sense, in the language of Chazal, Nase Shutaf Lamaisa Bresha. We, so to speak, become a partner with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's the second covenant. And that's already much more personal. That is much more personal. Okay, and now we're moving in from Lech Lecha to Vayera. And Vayera begins with the famous story that we all learned in Cheda, and which the kids love so much, Avram Avinu and his, and his three guests, the three Malachim uh, who come to visit Avram Avinu, Except the Torah doesn't call them Malachim. The Torah calls them Anoshim. The Torah calls them three men uh, come to visit. We from, from Cheda, we're already learning a Pirish Rashi and the Pirish of the, of the Medrash. Uh, and that's, in a sense, part of the problem we sometimes have that uh, we are taught as kids, we're taught Chumash uh, with, without the Pshat before we get, we get the Drash before the Pshat in a certain sense, but that's the way it is, that's the way it's ever been, and, and, it, and it's a way of getting, uh, make, making the text a bit more um, uh, exciting. Simply having three dusty travelers coming in for tea in the afternoon is, is, is not an exciting event, but having three malachim uh, knocking on your door, um, each one with a different job, okay, that's an interesting story. So that's really what we're gonna be looking at a bit more uh, in, in depth. So let's have a look at some text for a minute. See if I can get a text up here on the screen. Are we doing, Ellie? Can you see a text? Yes, Abram and his yes, good. Shirley's got it. Okay, thank you. Abram and his three guests. Okay, so let's just have a look at, at, at the first two psukim and see what's going on here. Right, by Yero Elov Hashem, by Elone Mamre, Hakadosh Baruch appears to Avram Avinu. In a particular spot, which is called Elone Mamre, for who Yoshev and what's he doing? He's sitting Pesach oil at the entrance to his tent, Kachom Hayo, in the heat of the day. Now, what's interesting about this pasuk? Are we also familiar with this pasuk in many ways. People are learning, you know, heard laning and, and gone to Cheder and learned Chumash. Well, maybe sometimes fail to realize. This pasuk is actually, in the context of the Chumash, uh, very strange, uh, because Akarish Baruch Hu appears often to Nevi'im in order to give them a message of one sort or another. Here we have a situation, 
Vayero Elav Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch appears to Avram Avinu, but he doesn't say anything. There is no communication here. There seems to be no message at all. It's just Hashem appears to Avram Avinu, yes, and what? So when HaKadosh Baruch appears to Moshe Rabbeinu in the burning bush, he's got a message for him. The message is, go and take the Jewish people out of Egypt, right? HaKadosh Baruch appears to Avram Avinu later on, um, to do the Akedah. So when, when Akadosh Baruch Hu appears in the Chumash to an individual, uh, it's for the purpose of a prophetic message uh, in, every, in, every, in every case, right? There is no appearance of Akadosh Baruch Hu simply to have that experience. So the question is, what could this possibly mean? Why is Akadosh Baruch Hu appearing uh, to Avraham Avinu um, at this particular point? Uh, for what purpose? What is the nature of this uh, a particular uh, prophetic type of moment which has no toichen to it? It has no, has no content. It has no message, right? You'll get an email sometimes, and the email will say, this email has no content, right? What is, uh, somebody sent you an email by mistake or sent you an email just with a heading, uh, with an address with no content. It's got no content. There was no message here. Which broker knocks on Abraham's door, yes, and now what? Uh, but that doesn't say anything at all. So we're going to look at, at, at the Mephor Sheikh Hazal, and we're going to see, I think, uh, three, different mess- three different answers to this question. Uh, each one of them is very fascinating. But you will see how Hazal really grappled with this initial question uh, of of, of Vayera. And you will see that, that in actual fact, uh, this is this experience of Avraham Avinu with the three Malachim is is a foundational experience um, going forward in, in Klal Yisrael. So let's have a look. Let's first see the classic interpretation of Rashi. The Rashi says something very interesting. Rashi says, "Here's Rashi." Okay. The Rashi says, "Vayera Elav, Hakadosh Baruch Hu appears to him." Levaker es to 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 do bikkur chole. Why is he a chole? Omer of Chama Bachanina quotes the Gemara in Bob Matzia that paid of Yom Shalishi lemiloso hoya. It was the third day after the bris mila. In actual fact, in other words, this story, this story of the three malachim coming to visit Avraham Avinu and he's sitting Pesach Ha'oel Kachom Yom takes place immediately subsequent to the bris mila, right? And what happened? Uvo HaKadosh Baruch Hu V'sho'al B'Shlema. HaKadosh Baruch Hu came, so L'sho'al B'Shlema simply means uh, to pay him a visit, to pay him a visit, right? We use it also in modern Hebrew, L'sho'al B'Shlema literally means to see how he's doing, to see how he's doing. And here's an interesting thing. Why does Rashi say Levake Esachode? How does Rashi know that? How do Chazal know that? And the answer is, it's, it's an answer to the question that I asked before, because Chazal were bothered by this question. The question was, what was the content of this experience that Avraham had receiving a Gilui Shechina from HaKadosh Baruch Hu without a message? And the answer is, there was no message. The message was simply in the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu came to do the mitzvah of Bikur Chole. Very interesting idea, this. But in actual fact, Kadosh Baruch visits Avraham Avinu, and that when you visit somebody who is sick, you're not actually coming to tell them something, nor are you coming to ask them something. You're coming just to, to be there, just to, just to have your presence there, that they should feel uh, that you care, that you're interested in them. So it's actually, Bikur Cholim is a... Uh, um, expression of care and concern, right? And the connection to the bris mila, I think, is, is, is uh, Chazal understood this from the Pasuk, because the Pasuk could have said, Vayera Hashem el Avram instead of which it uses the pronoun, Vayera Elov Hashem Veiloni Mamre, which is also very unusual. You see, in this first Pasuk, this Pasuk that we looked at just a moment ago, right? The Pasuk doesn't mention the name Avram at all. It says, Vayera Elov Hashem Veiloni Mamre, HaKadosh Baruch Hu appeared to him. Now, you only use a pronoun instead of a name 
if it's a continuation of a previous narrative where you, where you know clearly who it is, right? So Chazan understood that this event is a natural continuation of the previous event. What was the previous event? The bris milah. So here's Avraham Avinu at 99 years old, having a bris milah. That in itself is no small matter at that age uh, to have a bris milah at 99 years old. And clearly he is sort of post-operative, so to speak. He's recovering from the operation. And I can speak of a a love, Hashem. Hashem appears to him, Avraham Avinu, as mentioned two or three psukim before. And he says nothing to him because he hadn't come to give him a message. The message he'd already given him before he did the bris mila. He said, do the bris, and that will be os bris coach. That will be the sign of our personal relationship with each other. And, and uh, now he's only coming to, in some way, show his care and concern. Just by the way, it's worth mentioning, um, we all know that Biko Cholim is an important visit, is an important mitzvah, right? Where in, the, where in the Torah do we find the mitzvah to do Biko Cholim? Uh, Rabbi Yosef, for five points. Where, where is there a mitzvah? Uh, where's, where does the Torah tell us there's a mitzvah to do Biko Cholim? Where is that mentioned? That was when you go and do Biko Cholim, what mitzvah are you doing? Everyone knows it's a mitzvah, but what is the mitzvah? And he offers, Dina, you must know that answer the question. <laughs> okay, what's the mitzvah that we're doing, ladies and gentlemen? We're doing a mitzvah with Biko Cholim. Okay? Incidentally, Biko Cholim is often a neglected mitzvah. I mean, there are people who really understand that visiting sick people is a mitzvah, but uh, um, it's a mitzvah for everybody. Every individual has a mitzvah to visit the chola. If you know that somebody's unwell, it's a very uh, important mitzvah to go in some way uh, to, uh, uh, to visit them, or at least to ring them up, right? Basically, the mitzvah of Bikr Cholim is to show care and concern. So the Rambam writes, Rambam writes about Bikr Cholim, that doing the mitzvah of Bikr Cholim is a classic fulfillment of the mitzvah of Vohafta L'Reacha Kumeicha. That's what the Rambam writes. The Torah tells you and the meaning of is do for other people, says the Rambam, what you would like them to do for you if you were in a similar situation. Right? If you were unwell, right, you would want people uh, to visit you or to pay attention to you or take notice or look after you. Right? And therefore, right, if you do it for them, that, says the Rambam, is a classic, a classic fulfillment of a hafta mereacha kamoich, and the same is true. Incidentally, the Rambam says the same thing about about nichum avelim, about comforting avelim to go and visit, to, to visit, to pay a shiva visit. What mitzvah? Next time you pay a shiva visit, you should ask yourself what mitzvah exactly am I performing by paying a shiva visit? And the Rambam will tell you for a hafta mereacha kamoich. That's the mitzvah, a massive, a massive, central, important mitzvah of the Torah, doing for others what you would like them to do for you in a similar situation. So these, these are mitzvahs, they are all derivatives of the haftar Recha Kamecha. It's also, incidentally, a classic example where the Torah gives us a klal without the prat. The whole of halacha revolves around the whole idea of prat and klal, klal and prat. In other words, the Torah gives us sometimes a general principle and doesn't give us the prati, doesn't give us the details of it. So this is a classic example. The general principle is and the details are things like all the mitzvahs, incidentally, of the Hebra Kadisha. All the mitzvahs of helping with the Hebra Kadisha, if you ask uh, the Rambam, what mitzvah are the Hebra Kadisha actually performing in terms of Tariyad mitzvahs? The answer is, for a hafta l'reacha kamecha. In other words, this, this mitzvah, hafta l'reacha kamecha, is massive. It, it covers every different type of gebilus chasodim uh, that we are familiar with. 
And, and that's why uh, uh, Rabbi Akiva famously says, it's a cloud. Every cloud, cloud meaning a general principle, has to be uh, um, translated into pratim, into details. And the details of after the Rech and Kabocha are, are massive. If somebody is desperately in need of a loan, a financial loan to lend the money, is a mitzvah after the Rech and Kabocha, right? If you can, right? This, these are all details of the klal of after Rech and Kabocha. And here we find actually this story is a uh, uh, brought as a, um, a uh, single example and a classic example of the chesed of Avraham Avinu. And Avraham Avinu is often associated with the middah of chesed. And indeed, Chazal say that Avraham Avinu went around the world teaching, right? That Akadosh Baruch was holoich v'nosoya. He, he traveled around. We don't find Avram ever building a house. Avram always lives in a tent. Why doesn't he build a house? He was quite wealthy at certain points in his life. He could have built himself a nice, a nice house, right? But he doesn't. He lives in a tent in order to be mobile, in order to he lived a peripatetic existence, going around from one place to another. And what was he doing? So the Apostle says, Vayikra b'shem Hashem. He's going around teaching, teaching the inhabitants of Eretz Canaan, teaching them about God. But Chazal say that Avraham Avinu had two, two classes. He didn't have just one class. He didn't just have the, he didn't just teach them Emunah. He taught them Emunah and Chesed. Emunah and Chesed are the two classes of Avraham Avinu, and they are intimately connected. What's the connection between Emunah and Chesed? We'll speak a bit more about that uh, maybe uh, uh, later on. But Parshas by Yero is always brought as the classic example of Avram engaging in Chesed in a most uh, remarkable, uh, most remarkable way. So that's Rashi's Pshat. Rashi's Pshat is that Akadosh Baruch Hu appears to Avram Avinu in a prophetic, in a moment of Gilui Shechina, and the purpose was uh, a Biko Cholim. And that's one pshat. So let's have a look for a moment at the Sforno. Let's see if I can find here the Sforno. I think I brought it here somewhere. Right. So the Sforno, here we have the Sforno. So the Sforno, one of the uh, great uh, Rishonim on the Chumash, has, has a slightly different page to this. Says the Sforno, why in this location? That's where the Brismida took place, Oz. And all his, uh, uh, the male members of his family were also part of the Bris. And there he, he experienced a moment of of Gilu Shechina, La'amo bebris, bebris. And that's because, says the Sforno, of the covenant. Kemishpot, that's what he's now going to say, Kemishpot l'kol kosi bris. Like whenever you have a bris, you need to have the presence of both parties. Avram is there. And it was a moment where Akadosh Baruch so to speak, is, 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 is participating in inverted commas participating with Avram in this covenant. When you have a covenant, it's like a contract, only more so, and that is between two parties. So you need the presence of two parties. Says the Sfano, this a moment of, of appearance of HaKadosh Baruch to Avram Avinu, uh, th this moment was the, the moment of where HaKadosh Baruch is coming, in a sense, to ratify this bris. Ke'inyan, similar to at the end of the Chumash, we find Atem Nitzavim Hayom, Avrocho Bebris, right? Moshe Rabbeinu, the last day of his life, he also makes Klal Yisrael stand before HaKadosh Baruch Hu and enter into a covenant. Ke'inyan, Yichel Sifnei Hashem, Vayamud Kala Am Bebris, right? That this was uh, the, the bris of the, that was, this is really, says the Sforno, the other half of the Mila. 
right? There's the Mila, which took place, Avram and his whole male household engage in the, in the Mila. And this is HaKadosh Baruch Hu coming to ratify the covenant. The Nirila Avram, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu appears to Avram and not to all the other people who had the bris, says the Sfano, because he was really the only one of all the people who had the bris who was muchan. In other words, this is an interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, topic. I won't go into it for the moment about exactly what do we know about how prophecy takes place. But prophecy uh, needs a, 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 a recipient who is muchan, who is in some way able to receive it. In other words, uh, human beings can't simply receive a spiritual experience without preparation for it. And here is Avraham Avinu having had the bris, and he's preparing himself for a nevuah. He knows that the bris is a, a, a sign of a covenant with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So now he's awaiting HaKadosh Baruch Hu's presence and this is what's happening. He says here, He says here, So it's interesting because it's and here now, okay, we'll go to that for the moment. And here now, the Svarno makes a very interesting last line here. Let's look at this last line. Look at this last line, very interesting. He says, Ulai. He says, Bishvil Zer, Nohagu. Don't forget that Svarno is writing in the 15th century, right? So he's writing, right, about 400 years ago, uh, 500 years ago. And he's saying, we have a minhag, don't we? He says. It's interesting that we still, we of course got that minhag as well. That neck, what we call the kise she'eliyahu hanovi. Right? If you look at a bris milah, there are two chairs always there. One chair where the sandik sits and holds the baby. And next to him is an empty chair. It's an empty chair. And we call that chair the chair of Elio Hanavi. And in the procedure, just before the bris, there's a special kibud of putting the baby on the kisesh Elio Hanavi. Why Elio Hanavi is a bit of a longer story, right? We want to, in some way, invite Elio Hanavi uh, to the bris milah. But the Svarno says, no, the origin of that extra chair is Vayero Elov Hashem Be'elone Mamre is in a sense a symbolic gesture to the idea that this is a covenant. And when you have a covenant, it's an agreement between two people, right? Between Avram Avinu and Akadosh Baruch. Hu. This chair, in a sense, is a welcoming chair, metaphorically, for the presence of Akadosh Baruch Hu to enter into the covenant with this new member of the Jewish people this baby who is going to have uh, this Osperis Kodesh. So this is a whole new interpretation the Svarna gives us of the Kisei Shel Elio Hanav. It, it is in fact a Kisei inviting the Rebbeinu to come moment to come for a moment and uh, uh, um, participate in the bris, like HaKadosh Baruch Hu did with Vayero Elo Hashem Beiloni Mamre, subsequent to the bris, there, he, there is, Avram Avinu can experience a prophetic moment of the presence of HaKadosh Baruch. I find this Svarno uh, particularly, uh, uh, particularly beautiful. So we've got now two answers to the question. The question was, what is the content? What is the meaning of this vision that Avram has, this special spiritual vision? Rashi says it was Biko Cholim, that he should feel like Amish Baruch is concerned about him on the third day after the Mila, and he's coming to visit him, like visiting the sick. The Svano says, no, it's not Bikr Cholim. It is an intrinsic part of the covenant that both parties should be present in some sense, that Abraham should feel that Akadosh Baruch Hu's presence is more revealed to him um, as part of the covenant process. And that's the extra chair that we have at every bris milah. 
that is the um, that's the spot. Okay, and and now I'd like to show you, actually, um, a third parish, a third parish in the writings of, of the Rambat. Now this parish is going to be a little bit uh, uh, unusual um, because what the Ramban is doing here, uh, the Ramban lived the generation after the Rambam, right? right? So the Rambam is living in the 12th century and the Ramban is living uh, 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 one generation later. Um, but what's interesting is that the, Ram the Ramban occasionally cites Maimonides cites the Rambam and, and argues with him uh, with the greatest with the, with the greatest possible respect. It's one of the interesting it's one of the interesting uh, um, dynamics of a learning Chumash is when you have a head-to-head -head discussion between the Ramban and the Rambam. Right? Of course, uh, what it means is that the Ramban will quote uh, Maimonides, and will say that can't possibly be true. It must be wrong, right? And these two views have remained for Klal Yisrael ever since, ever since, right? For the last 800 years, Klal Yisrael have been learning the debates between the Rambam and the Ramban, one of the, uh, the clash of the titans in terms of Parshanut Amikra, in terms of understanding what the Chumash means, Rambam and Ramban are really uh, um, a, a very fascinating uh, um, episode. And indeed, uh, books have been written already by the Rishonim, uh, answering all the questions that the Ramban had on the Rambam. So this was a real, like a dialectic that went on in the understanding of Chumash, but it gets us a little bit deeper into the question. Let's have, so let's have a look at the Ramban a little. I've edited it a little bit. I hope the Ramban forgives me for my editing. Um, okay, so what the Ramban does is, first of all, he quotes Rashi, and that's his custom. You see? That, that, right, he says, Rashi says that the whole point was Biko Cholim, and... Uh, it also gives us the next Rashi, which we haven't actually read yet, but I'm sure many of you will remember from Cheda, and that is a Rashi saying, quote, Rav Zechela, Omer Rav Chama Bachanina, so the Gemara says, Yem Shlish Mechaya. Right. And then, and then Rashi continues, and he says, Behinei Shlosha Anoshim, can you see the second paragraph? Behinei Shlosha Anoshim, the... Uh, that these were in fact malachim who came uh, disguised as human beings and why were there three right so we all know the answer to that one to tell sorrow the basura is toves the good news that she would have a child the echo the rappers is abram and the other one to give Avraham a refua shalema, the echod lafo chesedo. And one of the one of them came in order to uh, um, uh, destroy sedo, right? So actually, it is uh, in the language of Chazal, it's it's Gavriel, Michoel, and Refoel were the three malach, right? Uh, Gavriel is the din. Gavriel is coming to punish Sodom and destroy Sodom. Right? Rafael is coming to do his job, which is Rafua, and Michael is responsible for the future of Klal Yisrael, and he's coming to um, tell uh, uh, um, uh, to tell uh, Sora about his uh, 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 that she'll, she'll have a baby at, at the age of 90, she's going to give birth to. It's interesting to me always that in English, uh, the name Michael uh, became very popular uh, in the English language. And in actual fact, Michael is the Tsar of Yisrael. 
is in fact the Malach that looks after uh, Klal Yisrael and ensures uh, the safety of the future of Klal Yisrael and is the Melitz Yosha in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu on behalf of Klal Yisrael. And yet in the non-Jewish world, I'm not quite sure who was the first Michael um, in, uh, in, in the English culture many centuries ago, but it came very, uh, I remember, uh, so the word, the word uh, some of you might remember uh, Diane Fisher. Remember Diane Fisher in London? Does anybody remember? Yes, you remember Diane Fisher? Ellie, do you remember Diane Fisher? I think maybe Henry probably also remembers Diane Fisher. Diane Fisher was the uh, oh, Avesdin of the Federation for many years. And it was a, he was a real classic Litvisher god, right? He knew out of shots, he knew everything, but he also had a fantastic sense of humor. And he used to drive the other Rabonim crazy with his, uh, with his wit uh, and his humor. And uh, I, remember, I remember many, many stories with him. I won't tell you the whole thing, but his name was, his name was Michael Fisher. His name was Michael. He was named Michael. And, um, and there was one particular halachic uh, subject. I won't mention what it is at the moment. And there was a meeting of Rabonim, a big meeting, and one thing, another. And, 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 and Dan Fisher was there and he gave, he gave a shear on the subject and he was very lenient. Halachically, he was very lenient on the subject. Um, uh, and uh, he found a, het, a heta in a situation where most Rabbonim didn't find, didn't find any heterim. And he always prided himself that if there was a heta to be found, he would know how to find it. He would find a leniency. And, and, and at the end of his talk, he says, a boy, I know, I know that people criticize me for being too much of a Michael, right? But he says, what can I do? My English name is Michael. That's my name. My name is Michael. And because if I'm a Michael, then I'm always going to be Michael, right? That's, my name tells me that my job in life is to be Michael. So I'm always going to find a color. I'm going to find a leniency to be Michael, right? In Yiddish, you pronounce the word Michael, and if you say Michael, someone who is lenient, but in Yiddish you say, I'm a Michael, I'm a Michael. The Michael, I'm Michael, that's my name, I'm Michael Fisher. When I introduce myself I'm to, to the Goyim, I'm Michael Fisher, so I'm a Michael. So he actually took the word Michael and he made um, a, a joke out of it. And he was really, I must tell you, he had the most remarkable sense of humor. I can't resist, even though it's got nothing to do with Avraham Avinu and the Brismila, I can't resist telling you my second, uh, and, and one of my most favorite stories of, of, of Diane Fisher, which goes back about 30 years or so. I was attending a rabbinic conference in Brussels. There was a rabbinic conference, European conference of rabbis. And, and at that time, there was an initiative from the EU to ban Shechita and the, 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 uh, the um, Rabbonin wanted to send a delegation of Rabbonin to meet with the top EU officials to argue the case uh, that uh, uh, for Shrita, that they shouldn't ban it. Okay, without going into great details, I'm sure everybody's aware or read about it at one point or another. This is an ongoing issue with, with the non-Jewish authorities <coughs> in the 20th and 21st century. Yes, Shrita, no Shrita, anyhow. So it was decided that three or four Rabbonim would be the representatives to the EU conference and uh, at the meeting, and suddenly Diane Fisher puts up his hand and says, I would like to go along. I want to go with. So all the other thought, oh, they, what, what's going to happen now? You know, Diane Fisher is going to, he's got a plan. Oh, you saw straight away, he had a twinkle in his eye. He had a plan. What's he going to do? And he wasn't the most, how shall I put it, the most um, tactful politically tactful person. It was a bit of a blunt litvak. He, he said it, he said it like it was. Anyhow, cut a long story short, they had a whole discussion, one thing and another, and the Rabbani made a presentation, and Diane Fisher sat quietly, and towards the end of the meeting, so you must understand you've got these, these two goyim sitting there, who are top civil servants in the EU, they're in charge of, I think, agriculture and, and whatever it was, and, and they have to make a decision about, about, uh, um, uh, about Shechita. So Dan Fisher says, he says, I, I would like to ask you something. Okay, so they says, what would you like? He says, are you a Christian? 
he would say, to, he asked these two, these two officials, are you a Christian? So they looked a little bit uh, sort of uh, shocked. This was not, 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 wasn't supposed to be a theological event. So they said, yes, yes, we're Christians. He says, are you a believing Christian? He says, yes, yes, we are, we are believing Christians. He says, do you believe that your Jesus will come back again to you? So they said, yes, yes, we believe in the second coming. Jesus will come back. He says, I want to tell you something. He says, when your Jesus comes back, he will only eat my meat and not yours. He says, you have to permit Shita in order to offer Yoshki a meal. Right? Basically, he says, how can you forbid Shita? You're waiting every day for your savior to come back again, and he only eats kosher. You can't offer him any food, so you can't ban Shita. That was what he was saying to them. And everybody was like, it was like they, they, the, the officials really, their face changed color. And it was really a, an original and somewhat humorous and uh, offensive of, of Diane Fisher using sort of his insights into Christianity. Um, he spoke often about Christianity, he knew a lot about Christianity for some reason. And he was, uh, uh, he actually had, as, as a teenager, he, he spent time with the Chofetz Chaim in, in Poland. He, he knew the Chobetz Chaim, he spent time with the Chobetz Chaim in Poland, in Radin, and there were certain issues about Christianity which he discussed with the Chobetz Chaim, which is, which is for another time. Uh, I've only got into all these little anecdotes because of, of Michael, right? That his name was Michael, was Michael, and he prided himself that he was a Michael, that he was a Michael, right? And but in the story of Vayera, you have Michael, Gavriel, and Raphael, the three Malachim, Coming uh, to um, uh, coming to Abraham's house, and each one has a a, a different uh, a role to play. Let's go back to the text for a minute. You can see the rabbinic life is more entertaining than people sometimes uh, realize uh, realize that it is because you have colorful characters uh, to um, uh, in the rabbinate. Okay, and now comes a really radical interpretation, which is uh, quoted here by the Ramban, which is crucial uh, for, for general knowledge. This is, this is something they don't teach you in Chayda. Says the Ramban, or the Sefer Murin Nebuchim, in the book of the Murin Nebuchim, which was, of course, the classic uh, philosophical text written by the Rambam at the end of his life, arguably one of the most difficult philosoph Jewish philosophy books ever written. In Mer Nebuchim Neymar, there is written as follows, Ki aparsha klal uprat. I mentioned before about klal uprat, right? Klal uprat means a general principle and then details of it, right? The Torah works in a system of klal uprat. So I said to you before that Mahafta Rech is a klal and Bikocholim is a prat, is a detail. But here the Mary Nebuchim is using this phrase in a slightly different way. He says that the first opening paragraph of Vayera, you have to understand as a Kalalu Prat. How so? Oma HaKosov, right? This is how you read the Chumash, says the Rambam. Oma HaKosov, Tchila, Ki Niro Elov Hashem, Bamaras Hanavua. The parsha starts off by saying, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu appeared to Avraham Avinu in a prophetic vision. That's the club. That's the, the general introduction. And now what follows is, now wait for it, what follows is the details of the vision. Now Avraham Avinu is having a vision. by Avraham Avinu is having a vision. Says the Rambam, what was the vision? So he says here, the Echoisa, the Echoisa Hamare Hazos, what was the content of the vision? So you see, the Rambam is still grappling with the same problem I mentioned at the beginning of the Shia. What was the content of this experience? Rashi says the content was Bikr Cholim. The Svarna says the content was making the bris. He says something else completely. 
the content of this vision was Kinosa Einok, that Avraham Avinu lifted up his eyes, but he didn't lift up his eyes in the real physical world. He's lifting up his eyes Bamare in the vision. And there are three people visiting him in the vision, not in the physical real world. And to these people in his vision, he says, This whole narrative, this whole event takes place not in the physical world, but it takes place in the world of Avram Avinu's prophetic vision. So what do you think of that, ladies and gentlemen? You have here the Rambam telling you that the story of Vayera Elov Hashem and the three Malachim coming to visit Avram and giving them food to eat, and they are telling him that the Yitzchak is going to be born. That whole story takes place where? Takes place inside the head of Avraham Avinu. In actual fact, if there would have been a photographer present outside the tent of Avraham Avinu at that moment, all the photographer would have been able to record is Avraham sitting there in a trance, experiencing a nevua, and that's it. There were no, in the physical world of real events, there were no Malachim coming. And, the, and all this was a, the vision of Avraham Avinu. This is what it says in the Murray Nebuchim. And this is one of the uh, examples where the Rambam takes the view that what is recorded in the Torah is meant to be taken uh, uh, metaphorically rather than literally. And this is probably one of the most, how shall I put it, one of the most uh, dramatic examples of this issue. Incidentally, this is you know, it's in terms of Method. Since we are a group of people who learn Chumash together weekly, it's important to know that methodologically, in terms of learning Chumash, one of the biggest questions that the Mepharshim have to deal with throughout the Chumash is, are there details in the Chumash which are metaphors rather than descriptions of reality? Is, is it real or is it a metaphor, right? In the Parsha that we read, uh, um, this Shabbos, right, that Bilam's donkey starts speaking, the speaking donkey, right, was there in, in the real world, was there a donkey that started speaking, or was this a vision that Bilam had? Don't forget, Bilam has visions all the time. He sees visions of God. Bilam is a prophet, right? So we generally learned, and we all always learn, and Rashi learns, and most of them are Farshim learn that actually there was a talking donkey and that it was a miracle and there was a nace, the talking donkey, right? In fact, the Kliyoko even says that the talking donkey was a sort of an attempt to, to bring Bilam down a peg or two, to, to diminish his, his raging gaiva, his raging uh, sense of, of superiority and of arrogance, and to tell him that actually. His whole role here in this story was nothing more than a speaking donkey. You know, like the like Akadosh Baruch Hu chose to put words in the mouth of the donkey, Akadosh Baruch Hu will put words into Bilam's mouth, and that he shouldn't think that he's anyhow in any way a great person simply because Akadosh Baruch Hu is using him as a conduit uh, to bless Klal Yisrael. That's the Kliyakim. But actually, the question of was there in the, if there would have been a photographer there, would he have recorded a speaking dump, right? So if the answer is yes, then it's simply a miracle. It's one of the supernatural moments of the, of the narrative of the Chumash, of which there are many. But for example, the Ibn Ezra, the Ibn Ezra on the Parsha of Bala says explicitly, of course a donkey doesn't talk. And of course, the Torah is not telling us there was actually a real donkey that started saying real words. You can't possibly believe that, says the Ibn Ezra. What we're talking about actually is a vision that Bilam is having a vision. And in the vision, he gets a, a talking donkey. And in the vision, he sees a malach holding a sword. 
and he has this conversation with the Malach, and all this is a nevuah. Right? Most of the Mafarshim do not agree with the Ibn Ezra, right? But the fact that there is the Ibn Ezra saying this shows that in our methodology of learning Chumash, we always have to be aware that if the Torah records something which, which looks to be uh, um, irrational or super, supernatural, we have to ask ourselves, did this happen in the real world and it was a nace? And of course, there were many missing the 10, the 10 plagues and Kriyas Yamsov, etc. These were real events which were supernatural. But there are also events described in the Torah which were not uh, uh, supernatural. They simply existed in the, in the minds of the people involved. So for example, in Gan Eden, right? Um, the Mephorshim grapple with the question, was there a talking snake in Gan Eden or not, right? And this is a very interesting discussion and debate among, among Gadole Yisrael. So some of them say, of course there was a talking snake and the talking snake was cursed and the talking snake uh, was seducing Chava and, and uh, caused her to do the, do the Avera. And there was actually a real snake who was really talking, right? Other Mephorshim say, and of course, the Svarno, for example, says that, of course, the talking snake is a metaphor for the Yetzirah in the mind of Chava, tempting her to go against the Rots and Hashem. So you see that there are different commentaries who've got different schools of thought on this subject. And sometimes these debates are quite fierce. What we have here in Parshas Vayera, I've only got a few more minutes left, but if you have a look at this Ramban very briefly, and see, see what the Ramban says about this. So the Ramban quotes, um, quotes the Rambam and says the Rambam tells us that this is, the, this is uh, a, a, a nevua, that the three malachim appear to Avraham Avinu in a prophetic vision. And, and look what he said. And, th and this here, the Ramban gives us his, uh, um, his response to this piece of Rambam. Look what he says here in the highlighted one liner here. The Elu Devorin Sosurim Hakosim. These words of the Rambam go against the Pasuk. Of course, they don't go against the Pasuk, they're just an interpretation of the Pasuk, which the Rambam finds unacceptable, right? But actually, they go, so he says, Osul Shomar. You're not allowed to listen to them, afki laham in lahem, or to believe them. That's very interesting. So first of all, it's, it's interesting to note that the Ramban, you know, is using here pretty, uh, pretty fierce language, right? He's saying the Rambam is wrong. You're not allowed to even hear these ideas, and you're not allowed to believe in these ideas. So let me ask you a question. If you're not allowed to hear them or believe them, why is the Ramban citing it? And the Ramban is citing the, the Murray Nebuchadnezzar. Don't forget, the commentary of the Ramban is something that is very widely read. The Murray Nebuchadnezzar is something which is hardly read at all by anybody. You can check with all your friends and ask them, do you ever sit down and learn the Murray Nebuchadnezzar? And you'll find that 1% of them have sat down to write the Mara But if you ask people, have you asked the Ram, learned the Ramban al -Tayra? Many people occasionally look at, look at the Ramban al -Tayra. It's one of the classic Mephorshim. So here's the, well, the Ramban is doing something very strange. He is, in fact, publicizing the view of the Rambam and then saying, you mustn't listen to this and you mustn't believe in it, right? So clearly the Ramban is saying, that there is this other school of thought here. There is another school of thought in this whole Parsha of Vayera, <laughs> that this entire event was part of the Nebuah. And what he's saying is, I personally, the Ramban, don't accept this. But this is the view, and it's also interesting to see that the, 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 the Ramban, when he speaks about the Rambam, he calls him Harav. Harav. He says the Rav, and he doesn't specify, he means the Rambam. So here you have an interesting thing. You have the Ramban, a generation after Maimonides, 
who, is, who disagrees violently with certain ideas of the Rambam, but he does it in a context of massive respect and massive admiration of the Rambam. And he's saying, look, the Rambam had a particular view of how to understand uh, the Chumash, and in certain places, he decides that this is a metaphor and not a description of a physical reality. Here, the Ramban disagrees with it. Let's just summarize for a second, and then uh, we'll come to an end. So we asked a question in the beginning. God appears to Avraham Avinu and says nothing. So this is a message without a content. What, what sense can we make of that? So there are three answers to this question. One answer is Rashi, that the message was simply Biko Cholim, HaKadosh Baruch who appeared to Avraham Avinu in a vision in order to, to, to strengthen him and, and show his concern. That's Biko Cholim, that's Rashi. Then you have the Sforno who says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu appeared to Avraham immediately subsequent to the Brismila, because that was an intrinsic part of the covenant. And that's why we have the chair next to the moil, right? The chair is that next to the sandik. We have a chair because that shows that, I can, that, this is, that a bris needs two sides to the, to the deal. So I can show whose presence was important. And you have the Rambam. And the Rambam says, what was the content of the Nevoah? I can show who appears to have Ram Avinu in a prophecy. What was the content of the prophecy? The content of the prophecy was that three malachim come to visit him and sit down for lunch and he give, and give him the message that his wife will give birth to Yitzchak and that is the content of the Nebuah. So what the Rambam is doing, he's answering this question. It's not possible, says the Rambam, that there was a, a, a Nebuah without a message. So he's saying the events described subsequently of the three malachim, that was the message. That was the message. The message was these malachim coming. So if so, why is Avraham Avinu in his dream giving them all this uh, food and looking after them and doing the chesed? So for the Rambam, the answer is the message that Akash Baruch is giving Avraham is that as a consequence of all the chesed that he's been doing, he is going to have the Basuras Tevas, the news of that his 90-year-old wife is going to give birth to Yitzchak. And, and, and that's not just coming out of the blue, it's coming as a consequence of all the chesed that he's done. And that chesed is symbolized in the nevuah of him, him giving lunch to all these, to these three malachim. So here you have three answers to an interesting question at the beginning of Vayera. And there are all, if you like, the, the, <coughs> the, 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 the after story to the bris meal. All of them are meant to be uh, uh, describing the consequences and the, uh, uh, and the uh, if you like, the, the way in which the Brismila opened the door for Avraham Avinu for a new, a new stage in his life, that he would indeed give birth to Yitzchak and, and, uh, uh, and going forward. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to see you all, as always. I hope you enjoyed this. A question with three answers, taking us a bit deeper into um, the uh, um, 